Y bueno, hello and welcome everyone to this new episode of InfoMarte. We have a very special guest today that is Dr. Scott Forbes, better known, better known as Dr. Creating. We are going to ask him the questions that we organize with your help in order to learn deeper into specific topics about creating. Yes, and it's really nice to actually formally introduce ourselves. Uh, so we are Karen Zarate. Karen is a personal certified personal trainer. And I'm Andrea Iñiguez. I'm also a personal training and trainer and I'm studying the bachelor's in nutrition. And yes, so we're really excited to have you here and we really appreciate the time you're taking and sharing your knowledge with all of us. Yes, I, I'm very, very happy to be here. And uh, anytime I get to talk about creatine, I get really excited. So um, <laughs> yeah, just invite me anytime you want. Perfect, thank you very much. Well, we already introduced you, but can you briefly tell us about your story and why did you choose to study creating as your main focus? Yeah, so um, just like uh, I, I started out with my bachelor's of kinesiology. So that's uh, what my interest in, was involved with sport and I really liked uh, sport nutrition. And during my, my fourth year, I actually got engaged with research and got really excited. And then I continued on to do a master's degree. And during my master's degree, I got connected with Darren Kando, who has uh, studied a lot of creatine supplementation. Um, but we were actually studying the effects of Red Bull. So uh, to see if Red Bull can enhance upper body muscular endurance and uh, anaerobic performance on a Wingate test. Um, and we studied a couple other supplements as well. But uh, that's where we first connected. And then I went on and did my PhD in sport nutrition, and then uh, just kind of continued studying uh, creatine supplementation beyond that. Oh, nice. very interesting. That's really interesting, very interesting. And um, well, we actually built this entire question section from the questions and concerns from our followers. So that's why they really, really excited about this live, and we are also really excited. But one of the most popular questions was about, because our audience is, are mainly women, so there's a lot of this polycystic ovary syndrome, and it's heard that you should not supplement with creatine while having this condition. So we want to know a little bit about it. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I can tell you that there is no uh, research that has examined creatine supplementation in that particular population. But I don't see any reason to not take creatine, um, even in, in that situation. And, and creatine is not going to have an effect on hormones, um, except for a few hormones that we can discuss later, such as IGF-1. Um, but uh, overall, creatine is extremely safe to take in a variety of different populations, in, including uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome as well. So, um, yeah, so it can it can have a benefit and it can actually improve insulin sensitivity. So that could be a benefit in that particular population and other populations such as uh, diabetes. That's really interesting. So there's nothing wrong with taking creatine while having uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. perfect. That's really nice to know. I have a lot of clients, and I think that Andrea has also clients with that, and it's good to know that they can be safely drinking the creatine every day. And yeah. well, talking about uh, pregnancy when consuming creatine, uh, the data has showed something that they can do and that is safe. But speaking of evidence, what is the most recent on this topic? Yeah, so that, that's another uh, great question as well. And the way I'm going to start answering that question is that the evidence is limited. So there's not a lot of human evidence, um, but there is um, quite a bit of animal evidence to, to suggest that protein is safe to take, can have a positive effect in a variety of different uh, situations. Uh, first, that actually creatine can influence uh, sperm. So if you're trying to get pregnant, um, that could be a, a benefit. We also know that it can influence uh, female reproduction as well. And uh, basically the way that creatine works is once it gets into a cell, 
gets converted into phosphocreatine and phosphocreatine can be broken down into energy or ATP very rapidly. And so any uh, uh, tissue that requires a high amount of energy um, quickly could benefit from creatine supplementation. So it could be important during, uh, during pregnancy in females. And then we also know that uh, it could potentially be a benefit uh, to the baby when um, complications occur during the birthing process. So if there's a lack of oxygen that's going to the baby um, during um, birth, then uh, it could be a benefit to actually have creatine supplementation and for there to be more creatine in the baby. Wow, that's really interesting. And of course, well, then the next question is regarding breastfeeding because our muscle mummies are a little bit scared with creatine supplementation and breastfeeding. So I kind of like know the answer, but can you talk a little bit more about that too, please? Yeah, so same thing, the, data, the actual evidence is, is really limited, um, but uh, we know that it, it's, it's most likely safe to take when breastfeeding. Um, some of the situations where you might want to be aware of is that if you do take creatine, um, some of that can be transferred to the breast milk and increase creatine within the baby. And um, that can be converted into creatinine. If they're trying to function, um, you need to take that into consideration. So um, just something to be aware of, but for the most part, from my knowledge, that creatine is safe to take during breastfeeding. Okay. okay. So is there any problem with that, with the baby showing a little bit of, uh, I don't know, awkward activity in the kidney? No. So um, basically, you just don't want to misdiagnose the increase in creatinine as kidney dysfunction in the baby. So if there's a situation that they're examining kidney function, they, I would probably suggest not to supplement with creatine in that particular situation, but it's nothing to be uh, concerned about. So this has been misinterpreted in healthy individuals as well. We know that uh, creatine is non-enzymatically degraded into creatinine mm -hmm. and creatinine is often used as an indication of kidney function. So if creatinine goes up, that indicates kidney dysfunction in a normal situation. But if you have a high amount of muscle mass, you consume a lot of protein, or you supplement with creatine, that's going to increase creatinine levels. And that's normal. That doesn't mean that your kidneys are actually function, uh, mal, uh, malfunctioning. It just means that uh, uh, basically that your creatine intake went up. And so creatinine went up or your muscle mass went up. So your creatinine levels went up. Um, so you need to take that into consideration. So there's other markers of kidney function that should be used in those particular situations, such as uh, cystatin C, um, which is not influenced by creatine or muscle mass or dietary intake of protein, but can indicate uh, kidney function. Okay, interesting. Good to Thank know. you very much for that. <laughs> and well, we know that creatine is a very safe supplement to consume at or stage. However, is there any recommendation to pause or take breaks from its consumption, or is safe enough to take for a lifetime? Yeah, so the longest in the scientific literature is 5.6 years. Um, so we know that taking it for 5.6 years has no detrimental effect on kidney or liver uh, function. So we assume that if it hasn't done anything after 5.6 years, that it's probably safe to take for a really long period of time, perhaps a lifespan. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. We know that uh, creatine is extremely safe to take for long periods of time. And uh, yeah, I, I, there's no, no reason to, to cycle on and off creatine. You can if you want. So we know that if you stop taking creatine, it takes about four to six weeks for your creatine levels to return back to baseline. But uh, so you can cycle on and off creatine if you want, but you don't have to, and you can take it for long periods of time. Perfect. So that's regarding health, but what would you say about endurance resistance or muscle growth? 
does it we need to take like a rest or a pause because it impairs some way or still the same thing so you uh you don't have to pause creatine at all so there was okay. some animal studies to show that if you take a, a very large dose of creatine that it can slow down um, your body's ability to make creatine but in human studies using uh kind of recommended doses between five grams to 20 grams per day it actually has no influence on our body's ability to continue to produce creatine at the levels before supplementation um, so you can take creatine for long uh, long periods of time it's not going to influence how your body actually creates creatine and the other thing too um, is that the more creatine you have in your muscles kind of the better your performance is going to be so again, it, it's an energy booster, essentially. So the more fossil creatine you have, the more energy you can produce, and uh, that's going to help your performance. Okay, perfect. Okay. So now we know that creatine, we can take like every day for a lifetime, and we can include as, a, as our lifestyle, as our diet. So it's very safe. Cool. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So we know it's safe, but would you say there are specific situations where when a medical prescription would be needed? Yeah, so, so I think if somebody has uh, kidney disease, I would definitely speak to a medical professional and uh, ask them about creatine supplementation. And again, there's just limited evidence in that particular population. But I know there's uh, currently some research going on in individuals going through dialysis. So if you have a kidney disease, you need to go through dialysis. And during that process, you actually lose um, bodily creatine. And so that can have a negative effect because we know that creatine can have a positive effect on muscle performance. It could have a positive effect on your bone and it could also influence your brain function as well. So um, if you're losing creatine through dialysis, that can have a detrimental effect on your ability to function. And so they're actually looking at creatine supplementation in that population. So normally I would say, you know, if you have kidney disease, don't take creatine, it's, it's unsafe. But there's some evidence that's coming out now that's basically showing that perhaps it is safe in that population. Hey, thank you. Good to know. <laughs> And we know that creatine does not contain sugar or calories at all, but could it potentially elevate blood glucose levels in individuals? If somebody has diabetes? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question. There's actually a couple of studies that have looked at creatine supplementation in diabetes, um, mainly from a Brazilian group. So Bruno Gulano, Hamilton Rochelle, there are some researchers that have looked at creatine supplementation in, in diabetics, and they show that uh, when you combine it with exercise, it has a positive effect. So it lowers uh, each, uh, this uh, hemoglobin um, molecule, and uh, yeah, it can definitely have a, a benefit on uh, glucose control. And as I mentioned earlier, it can increase uh, insulin sensitivity as well. So. If you take creatine, you could actually increase GLUT4, and GLUT4 is the uh, glucose transporter within the muscle, and so that can have a benefit on controlling glucose and improving insulin sensitivity. So if you take creatine, it can have a positive effect on uh, individuals with diabetes. Perfect. So you need to know that we largely speak to people that make like this fitness life more in a recreative way so they are more like this fitness enthusiasts so alcohol is here and they're also part of the social life and we know of course that alcohol consumption is not good when we talk about performance and muscle protein synthesis but we also wanted to know if it impairs like you take alcohol or consume alcohol and then it impairs with creatine supplementation like uh, four days or a week or two that it will not, like it will mess up the whole thing. So uh, there, there are no studies that have combined creatine <laughs> with alcohol consumption. So maybe we have to do that study. Uh, yes. We know that alcohol <laughs> consumption, it impairs muscle protein synthesis. 
So if you're trying to build muscle, um, probably best to avoid alcohol, um, at, at least to really high uh, high concentrations or high high amounts of alcohol, it can really impair muscle protein synthesis. If you just have a, a couple of drinks here and there, um, your muscle protein synthesis is going to be fine and you could build a lot of muscle still. But I think if you are consuming alcohol, it could be a benefit to, uh, to take creatine um, because creatine, again, is just going to give you more energy and maybe you can counteract some of the negative effects of alcohol consumption. So that's my personal opinion um, that if you are going to consume alcohol, maybe increase your dose of creatine or make sure that you are taking creatine to minimize some of the detrimental effects. Perfect. Interesting. <laughs> and, and another popular question that we received is that if there's any relation between acne and creatine intake, are there any contradictions for people with acne when it comes to you creatine? Uh, no. I, I get that question all the time as well. And there's no link. There's no relationship between creatine and acne. And uh, I also, just to be certain, I looked up all the literature as well before this uh, uh, Instagram Live, and there is no research that has linked creatine with acne. So um, important for your listeners to know that, yeah, again, there's no relationship. Yeah, we got that, that question all the time, all the time. Um, and also a really popular one was for the people that are following an intermittent fasting program uh, early in the morning if they take creatine supplementation or creatine in any of its presentations but in water for example or with coffee uh, would it inhibit or finish the fast in that moment or it has nothing to do with the fast so uh, my opinion is it has nothing to do uh, with the fast. So creatine itself, the way it works is, again, it gets into a cell and it gets converted into phosphocreatine. Um, and then phosphocreatine can be broken down into energy. Um, but creatine is not going to stimulate insulin. It doesn't uh, give you calories. Um, so it, it's not going to break the fast. So you can take uh, creatine in a fasted state. Um, again, I, I think it could be a benefit in that particular situation. If your body is mm -hmm. in a fasted state, it's, um, it's going to be breaking down tissue and muscle protein breakdown is going to be elevated. And we know that creatine can uh, slow muscle protein breakdown. So um, again, that could be a benefit in, in a fasted situation. That's a really interesting point of view. I would wouldn't think about it but yes of course one thing to take in into account when making a fast is that you should spread well your protein intake because muscle protein synthesis goes down so yep creatine should help yes <laughs> creatine is a future <laughs> it's good in lots of different situations yeah yes yeah it's amazing like since i started studying about creatine and now I feel like it's not only performance, it's not only muscle mass, it's like beyond everything. <laughs> and well, I have a lot of clients that have some experience in uh, stomach discomfort while, when they take creatine. So is there any specific recommendation for them, like a lower dosage or a different form of project? Yeah, so there, my recommendation is a lower dose of creatine. So there are uh, some people that experience like bloating or stomach discomfort when they take creatine. And that, tip, that typically happens during the loading phase. So if you're taking uh, 20 grams per day for five to seven days, you can saturate your muscles with creatine, but uh, they might experience some side effects during that loading phase. And uh, what they found in the research is that if you just take a lower dose of creatine, you actually uh, reduce some of those side effects. So that would be one, one suggestion for sure, is just to take a lower dose, dose of creatine. You could also take uh, smaller doses throughout the day and uh, also maybe consume the creatine with food. So we know if you can consume creatine with carbohydrates and or protein, you could also increase creatine uptake as well. So that could be a benefit, but uh, that also might minimize some of the uh, side effects as well. 
So for example, if someone eats uh, five grams per day and they have like stomach discomfort, they can take in the morning 2.5 and in the night 2.5. Is this how it works? Yeah, absolutely. And we know okay. it's taking as little as three grams a day can saturate your muscles over about a 28 day period as well. So you can even try a little bit lower dose or you can try that separated 2.5 grams in the morning, 2.5 grams in the evening. Um, yeah, that will be just as effective as taking five gram dose. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, and I think this is also a really popular one. And um, what does creatine have to do with baldness? Is it, been, it has been observed lately that, <laughs> that it has to do, or do you know anything about it? <laughs> so that, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> If you look at myself and you look at any of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Darren Kandow, Jose Antonio, um, Bill Campbell, um, a lot of the uh, you know great creatine researchers around the world, we often lack hair. So that's uh, <laughs> maybe a link or a relationship. But uh, yeah, there's one study in rugby players where they showed an increased conversion of testosterone to, to dihydrotestosterone. And what they found, uh, yeah, so if you took creatine, you increased DHT, and DHT has been linked to male pattern baldness, but there's actually no study to ever look at uh, creatine and hair loss, and um, there's no real mechanism to why creatine would actually increase DHT or testosterone. Um, so, yeah, so right now there's, there's no evidence to suggest that creatine actually causes hair loss. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's so funny that all like the main fitness gurus, they are <laughs> like that. I think that but, Sammy will say later. <laughs> so we can part of the group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What happens if one takes, takes less or more than the recommended creatine dosage? Would there be any positive effect or is not worth taking such a small amount of creatine? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question as well. So from a muscle level, I believe that taking um, kind of anywhere between three to five grams, um, at least over a period of time, is going to saturate the muscles with creatine and enhance muscle performance. From a bone perspective, so we know now from some of the work of Darren Kandow and Bill Chilibeck that combining creatine with resistance training can enhance bone strength. And they just finished actually a two-year training study with almost 240 uh, postmenopausal females. So half of them were on creatine, half of them were on placebo. Those on creatine improved markers of bone strength and bone geometry. So the shape of the bone is actually a better indicator of bone strength than, um, for example, bone mineral density. And they found that uh, in the creatine group, it would enhance uh, some of these markers of bone geometry. So that's pretty cool. Um, but what they actually, the dose they actually used was uh, around 10 grams per day. And so if you, you actually look at the literature um, showing the benefits of creatine supplementation on bone health, it seems like 10 grams per day is actually recommended. So more than, than um, kind of that three to five grams, which is traditionally recommended for muscle performance. And then um, from the brain perspective, Again, if you supplement with creatine, you can increase the amount of creatine within the brain. It's a little bit more challenging to do so than at the muscle level, but uh, it might actually require an even higher dose. So maybe 10 to 20 grams per day of creatine. So I think if you're taking more than five grams of creatine per day, if you're taking 10 or 20 grams per day, it could have some other benefits, maybe not on your muscle performance, but it can enhance uh, perhaps your bone tissue or your, your brain health. Perfect, that's really interesting. I wouldn't imagine. <laughs> and what do you think about the currently dosage of 0 0.1 uh, grams per kilogram? Is it good or do you recommend anything else? Yeah, so that, that dosage is, uh, is, I would recommend it. Um, so, if you're about 70 kilograms, that would be about seven grams per day of creatine. 
And it kind of makes sense that a bigger person might need a little bit more creatine than a smaller person. So that's what that relative dosing strategy does. Um, it takes into account your, your body weight. And uh, so that would be perhaps one uh, recommended dosing strategy that I would that I would use. And a lot of my research studies, that's the dose that we uh, typically use is 0 0.1 grams of creatine per kilogram of body weight per day. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think you already answered this question, but if you would like to say anything more about taking creatine when in a rehab rehabilitation period of any injury or situation, how would this benefit uh, the creatine supplementation would benefit the injury and the whole process? Yeah, for sure. So again, I think it could be a benefit if you stop training. And there's actually um, a couple studies that have looked at this. One of them uh, is from uh, Darren, uh, Darren Kando. I've mentioned his name a few times. But uh, what they found was that um, if you take creatine and you immobilize a limb, so if you stop using a limb, it's going to get weaker and it's going to lose muscle mass. But if you take creatine, it's going to lose less muscle mass and lose less strength. So that could be a benefit, particularly uh, if you injure a limb, I would suggest to take creatine. So creatine could be a benefit in that particular situation. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. So let's go to the next question. Uh, we know that creatine uh, does not cause subcutaneous water retention, that makes us like a little bigger, but it can lead to intramuscular water retention. Why are there cases of individuals who feel that they retain more fluid with, when consuming creatine? Yeah, so if you take creatine, um, you're going to get more creatine within the muscle, and that's going to bring more water into the muscle. So that's where the water is going to be retained. So it's going to increase intracellular water retention. That's actually um, one of the mechanisms of that stimulates the muscle to grow. So a lot of people will think that it's bad um, to have more water within the muscle, but it's actually a good thing. It actually stimulates the muscle to grow over time. And there's a very nice study uh, done by a Brazilian group as well, and a co-author was Brad Schoenfeld. And what they looked at was the ratio of intracellular water to muscle mass. And what they, they measured that at the start of the study and after eight weeks of training with creatine. And what they found was that if you took creatine, you got bigger muscles, but that ratio of intracellular water to muscle mass actually stayed the same from the start of the study to the end of the study. So what that actually means is that um, when you start taking creatine, you're going to get creatine into the muscle. That's going to pull water into the muscle, cause the muscle to swell, and that's going to stimulate the muscle to grow. So that's one of the mechanisms to actually enhance muscle growth over time. So it's, it's actually a good thing to bring water into the muscle, and that is something that happens. You do retain a little bit of water when you take creatine, but uh, as I mentioned, that's an important mechanism. So it's a positive thing. <laughs> yes, yeah. Part of the process. <laughs> If you want to. Now, talking about hydration, but our hydration, what would you say about adequate hydration while supplementing with creatine? Because we have heard that incrementing the water intake 200, 300 millimeters a day when taking creatine should help. But can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah. Yeah. So you might gain muscle, as I mentioned previously. Um, and so you might want to increase your water intake a little bit. Um, I've seen on uh, in social media people suggesting that you need to consume a huge amount of water when you take creatine, which is not true. Um, if you mix creatine with water, um, so perhaps like 250 mils or um, maybe half a liter, um, that's sufficient. So that increase in water intake just by mixing creatine with that water is going to be sufficient. So you don't have to consume a huge amount of water 
when taking creatine, just a little bit more and uh, you'll be fine. Perfect. That's a really nice tip. <laughs> just take creatine with water and that's the more water that you would need throughout the day. <laughs> Absolutely. What happens when you stop consuming creatine for a period of time in relation to muscle or performance? Does it have any significant change or a specific percentage of reduction? So if you stop taking creatine, you're going to disappear. No, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, so there's, there's actually, again, Darren Kando has uh, done some research on this um, where he had individuals stop taking creatine and they looked at, at their loss in, in muscle strength and muscle size. And what they showed was no difference between uh, those taking creatine and the placebo group. So if you stop training or you reduce your training, then you're going to lose muscle mass and you're going to lose muscle strength. But uh, that rate of loss is actually going to be the exact same if you uh, go off creatine or, or if you didn't have creatine to begin with. Um, so that's, I think, important for people to understand that um, if you stop taking creatine, you're not going to lose all of your gains that you got from creatine, um, you're going to lose just your, your loss of muscle mass or strength at the same rate that you would have um, in a normal situation. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's comforting. <laughs> and this is also a really good one and a personal question also, because what is the latest evidence regarding coffee and caffeine? with the intake of creatine because at the really beginning of the creatine boom uh, we heard that taking creatine with caffeine actually stimulates the effects of creatine but then later on that was there was also uh, heard that then you talk you take creatine with caffeine it reduces the the effect of creatine so now we are a little bit confused with this situation <laughs> Yeah, so that's a, a great question as well. So in theory, they can have opposing effects within the muscle, particularly on calcium kinetics. So um, the recommendation is to not consume creatine and caffeine at the exact same time. But there's actually only been one study that has looked at, at the training effects when taking creatine and caffeine at the same time compared to creatine. And uh, that was a study that we conducted alongside uh, Darren Kando as well. And what we found was that if you took creatine and trained, you got bigger muscles. And particularly, uh, one of the muscles that we looked at was uh, your leg extensor, so your quadriceps. And we measured that with an ultrasound to look at muscle thickness. And so if you took creatine and trained, um, your quads got bigger compared to the placebo group. But if you took creatine and caffeine, it actually lessened the gains in your quadricep. We also measured um, hamstrings, and we actually found no difference between taking creatine and caffeine versus just creatine. We measured biceps. We found no difference between taking creatine or creatine and caffeine. We measured triceps, and we measured calves we found no difference between taking creatine or creatine and caffeine. So just that one measurement on the quadriceps, we actually found a statistical difference. So I'm still not 100% sure how to answer that question. Um, if you're really concerned, then take caffeine before you exercise and take creatine after. But if you really like to mix creatine and caffeine, I don't think it's going to have a major effect on your, your muscle performance. So we've also done some studies looking at creatine timing. So when is the best time to take creatine? And we found no difference between taking creatine before training, during training, or after training. And so um, you can take creatine after. You're still going to get the same gains compared to if you took creatine before training. So we know that the way that caffeine works is it's a stimulant. You should take that before you exercise, but creatine you can take after you exercise. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So it's only like if I take my creatine uh, every day, it can be, for example, after training. 
and you suggest like every 24 hours now so it starts like uh, getting in the cell okay and yeah. well, most of our followers are gene brats that they consume uh, creating for strength and performance but how could creating benefit in other physical activities such as yoga or soccer pilates yeah so again the the way that creatine works is it enhances uh, kind of uh, the energy within the muscle. So anything that requires uh, an increase in energy um, could benefit from, from creatine. It's probably going to have less of an effect uh, for yoga, but it can definitely benefit soccer performance um, because soccer involves bursts of activities where you have to sprint really fast. And that particular energy um, that's being used can, can benefit from creatine supplementation. So for sure, soccer players, I would uh, recommend taking uh, creatine supplementation. And then it could also enhance the cognitive uh, performance as well. So your brain can function better when taking creatine. And we know that soccer is a, kind of a stressful activity. You've got to make a lot of decisions really quickly. And I think creatine could be of benefit in that particular situation. Interesting. And last but not least, this is for our vegans or veggies out there. And we know for them it's really difficult to have a good creatine intake because of their diet and lifestyle. So do you have like a specific recommendations for them? Should they increase the dosage of creatine or they should stay the same because it would not make any difference? That is a great question. Um, so we know that, that if you're vegetarian or vegan, you actually have lower amounts of creatine within your muscle. And we know that if you supplement with creatine, um, it can really enhance your performance compared to omnivores. So, uh, that, um, so they can benefit for sure um, and more so than omnivores can from a muscle level. And that's that's been uh, well established in, in quite a few studies that vegans or vegetarians should be supplementing with creatine even more so than, than omnivores do. But uh, there's, from my knowledge, there's no uh, difference with regards to recommended dosages. So perhaps uh, if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you might want to do that loading phase or you might want to consume a slightly higher amount of creatine. Um, but uh, again, the, there's no research to suggest that. Um, that's just based off of some of our knowledge of what happens to the muscle level and how it's influenced by dietary intake. Okay, really interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I, I can see the questions in the question box. Oh. Um, so somebody asked about... Uh, they wanted to know what's the difference between creatine monohydrate and uh, creatine HCL. Hi. And uh, that, that's a great question as well. So there's um, creatine monohydrate is the recommended uh, form of creatine and it's the most studied form of creatine. We also know that it's uh, the cheapest form. We know that it's safe and we know that it's effective. Whereas creatine HCL is more expensive it's less studied, and um, there's no evidence that creatine HCL is any better than creatine monohydrate. So there's a couple animal studies to show that maybe if you take creatine HCL, uh, you can absorb a little bit more or it's better ab at absorption, but there's no human studies to support that. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be really cautious when we try to interpret what's happening in animals versus humans. And so right now, um, there is zero evidence to show that creatine HCL is actually absorbed better in humans and uh, to show that creatine is actually retained in muscle in humans better than uh, creatine monohydrate. So my recommendation is just take creatine monohydrate. Perfect. Thanks for answering the question. Thanks so much for the time. And all this information is awesome. We have a lot of homework to study. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, Dr. Forbes, we really appreciate your time and knowledge here. We were really excited and it was a really good life. And yes, we really appreciate your time here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and uh, happy to answer any more creatine questions that you may have. So yeah, thanks again. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can just uh, follow me on Instagram. That's probably the best. Or of course, uh, email or other ways to contact me, you can find on the internet. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my recommendation. So yeah, thank you for having me. And thanks for the awesome questions. Thanks. Thank much. you. Have a good night. Have a good night. <laughs> and thank muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs> gracias. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.